The Watts family murder occurred in Frederick, Colorado in early morning of August 13, 2018. Christopher Lee Watts was found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Shanann Catherine Watts, and their two daughters. This murder is a true tragedy for all American people. Stay tuned to the end of the story to find out what happened to Watts family. Hey everybody, say hi. Say hi. You don't want to say hi? Careful, Cece, there's a table there. Daddy. <laughs> uh, she is a hot mess. Uh, you have to take a leap of faith in yourself. No matter what it is in life, like take that leap of faith and know that you can do whatever you want to do. I was in a really, really, really bad place. And I got a friend, friend request from Chris on Facebook. And I was like, oh, what the heck? I'm never going to meet him. Except well, one thing led to another. And eight years later, we have two kids. We live in Colorado. And he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. And because of my health challenges, because I got so sick, I let him in. And he only knew me at that time. He knew me at my worst. And he accepted me. And, you know, through um, your vows, like through sickness and everything, he's been there. He was the one that let me lay on him and fall asleep for three and a half hours on his lap while he had to pee. Um, he is the best thing that has ever ever happened to me so with that being said know that no matter what I, I can go on forever with this story like but I want to cut it short so I don't bore you guys know that no matter how hard life gets no matter how low you feel know that deep down like in your heart that there's a purpose there's a reason for everything we may not understand it at the time <laughs> I like that shirt. Really? Really. That's awesome. So pink means... That's just the test. I know. It just says the pink is going to be girls. I don't know. Just the test. That's awesome. Nicole, and I'm calling because I'm concerned about um, a friend of mine. She's not answering the door. She's not responding to text messages, phone calls, and there's no movement in the house whatsoever. Hi. You're Nicole? Yes. Okay. What's going on? So, my friend, um, we were out of town for a business trip this weekend. Right. And I dropped her off at 2 o'clock this morning. She's 15 weeks pregnant. And she wasn't feeling well. And she had a doctor's appointment this morning at 9, and I told her to let me know if she needed me to take her. She's got two little girls. And um, she was very distraught over the weekend, wasn't eating normally or drinking, and we kept trying to force it on her because she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, her husband and her supposedly are separating, but she didn't know this. She thought they were just having issues. He disclosed that to me today. Because okay. I called him and I was like, have you talked or heard from Shanann since she left for work this morning? Because I can't get a hold of her. I called, I texted. Her car's in the garage. Her shoes she wears every single day right in the front door. She only has one vehicle? No, they only have the one vehicle and a work truck. Okay, that's what I'm asking. There's not a girl that went on a play date, but they're four and two. She went on a play date. Why wouldn't she take in a car? They're both in car seats. Police department, if anyone's inside, make yourself known. Police 
department. If anyone's inside, make yourself known. Is there a key code, Sammy, to, the, to open the garage from the outside? What is it? His mom's going to get it. Okay. Hey, Chris, Officer Coonrod for the police department. Pretty good. So, do you have any idea where your wife is? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see anything out of place. I'm not hearing kids. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, and all of her stuff is here, and I set off the alarm by trying to open the garage forcefully, and that didn't work. So, and their alarm's one of the ones where it goes off, and it feels like it's making your ears bleed. Mm -hmm. So, if she was in there... She should have heard it. Yeah, she would have while she was sleeping, because they have little things on the wall on every room to go off. The neighbor has a, a camera system. Mm -hmm. Scott, how you doing? How's it going? So this is the only vehicle she would have? Only one that, yeah. She would drive? Okay. We're checking the house, for consent. Oh. Well, um, any friends she, do you know she would be hanging out with? I mean, I know, I guess her, her, Amanda, her uh, parents are out of state. Across, across country, North Carolina. Oh. Yeah, so that's not happening. Check the player. All the girls blanky are gone. Um. They're blanky, they sleep with, they don't leave anywhere without them. Okay. Nothing else appears to be missing though, just no, stuff you'd take for a quick trip. Her phone's here? Her phone's here. Does she work? Yeah, she works from home. home. Oh, from home? She works, this is her lifeline. Do you guys have any kind of issues, marital issues, or? We're going through separation. You are? Did you guys file yet or anything, or are you just talking? No, we're going to, I won't, we're going to sell the house and do a separation. Now how's that going? Uh, I mean, it's, it's going civil for the most civil. part, or? <laughs> There was no note or anything by the wedding ring? No. It didn't look like she went through and packed up no, I a mean, bag or anything? No, I mean, all that in the bottom, so it'd be kind of hard to tell if she took a little bit or, I mean, it'd be easy to tell if she took a lot, but it's hard to tell if she took a little bit or not. Okay. Did she tell you anything about leaving, moving out? Not moving out. I mean, the last time I talked to her was this morning. She said she's going to take the kids to her friend's house and she asked where she was going to be. And then I've texted her today and never heard anything. But the car's, the car's here. The car's right. here. Unless somebody came and picked her up. But the people that I know, nobody's heard from her. Nobody's seen her. Right. Definitely an odd one. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do right now. She'll drive around and like the normal route that she would be. Where does she normally go to? I mean, just like drive where like she would normally take the kids to school. Um, people that I know that live down, you know, people that Kristen lives down that way. I mean, that's the only people, only routes I can know she really take. She go to their house frequently, or and not much, but. Uh, 
Yeah. Some wait for her here. Up here. Well, I, I've got my detective coming okay. just because this is kind of an odd situation. Um, if we can try to get her pinpointed down, find a friend or something. Okay. He may have you call the bank. Okay. Um, hey, sir, here's Chris Watts. Not too bad. Have you heard from Shane today? On continually yep. recording. Yep. Well, it's motion, not. Is it motion, motion or is it event. okay? So it's motion. Any motion event that happens, I got. But I get cars driving from this street, from this street. And this is him at five seventeen. Um, my detective just showed up. Um, so he'll probably want to talk to you. He'd probably. Like I said, you might have you call at the bank and see if there's any kind of activity. Because um, if there is any sort of action out there, of his cameras, I would have got it. Like right. had, I had, we had issues the other other week when people were, kind of, were stealing stuff out of like garages and stuff like that. And I have parked my truck. I right had here. park right here. Yeah. yeah. So if someone, see if I can see where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver over there, and it was just like. But if any action would have happened, any cars or anything left yeah. your house, I would have been like right in that area. It should have picked, I mean, like oh, it'll pick up anything coming down the street this way. You know where that trigger is? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Hopefully something comes up here. Yeah. No, if I, you just want to go talk to him, I'm going to get his info real quick. Shanann Watts and her two daughters, three-year-old Celeste and four-year-old Bella, vanished on Monday, their startling disappearance triggering a statewide alert as police and the FBI focus on her home outside Denver where she was last seen. When I got home yesterday, it was like a ghost town. Like, she wasn't here. Kids weren't here. I have no idea, like, where they went. Chris Watts, Shanann's husband, says his wife, who's also 15 weeks pregnant, came home from a business trip at 2 a.m. Monday. The couple having an emotional conversation, he says, before he left home around 5 a.m. Watts says Shanann never returned text messages later that morning and never answered the door when her friend arrived at the home at noon. Watts and says he knew something sense. was wrong. I was trying to get home as fast as I can. I was blowing through stoplights. I was blowing through everything, just trying to get home as fast as I can because none of this made sense. Police who have searched the family home and area with dogs say for now there are no significant leads. The 34-year-old doting mother's car still in the garage. She left her phone at home, her purse, her wallet, um, all of her money, her ID. So we need to have everybody step out of the house. Okay, mostly um, because we don't want this, the dog to get confused with okay. all the stuff going on. Correct. So you can leave that there? You can leave your camera there? Okay, I'll, I'll bring it okay. we I just... I don't want to mess you guys up at all. Because my, my son has, yeah. Just back to level nine, two, two. They moved in just before I did, five years ago. In fact, before the children were even born. Okay. Yeah. How, um, how would you describe your relationship with them? Cordial. Neighbor? Cordial? Yeah. Okay. I saw the father, and I see dad, um, the end of last week, maybe. Okay. Yeah, we, I was asking him about the lawn, because my lawn had started to die, and, oh, you know, what are you doing to keep your lawn green, <laughs> he Fair told enough. me. I would never have known, um, geez, that's scary. Um, Mom and dad used to live over there, too, with them. Okay. When yeah, was the last um, time you saw mom and dad? Oh, 
I believe it was dad, and that could have been maybe three weeks ago in the backyard. Okay. Anything different over the last, I don't know, two days, three days? Odd vehicles, odd noises, odd lights? There was a truck out here yesterday. In fact, that's why I thought you were here yesterday. Maybe okay. someone complained about that I hadn't seen off, seen before. What type and, of truck? Um, it was kind of almost a steel gray. Okay. Don't ask me, mate. Okay. <laughs> here. But that was late afternoon. The dad has a great big truck, and it's gray. But, you know, this is... This is unusual, very quiet neighborhood. Yes, yes, this is very unusual. That's why we're trying to get a lot of resources out here trying to find them and, and make sure they're yeah, okay. So, I, mean, um, I didn't know she was pregnant again. I hardly ever see her. Okay. How do you know she's pregnant? It said it on Neighborhood Watch. Okay. I gotcha. But you didn't know it? No. Okay. I hardly ever see her just normally. Right. Um, they keep very much to themselves. When you did see her, did you ever see her around her husband? Yeah. How they were would they? have barbecues. Yeah. Were they polite, friendly, or was she kind of quiet, did. reserved? Or how, what was? They both are very quiet, very quiet reserved, reserved, very quiet. Okay. When nice was the last neighbors. time you spoke to her? Oh, my gosh. I don't think I've seen her all summer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And yeah. kiddos, when was the last time you saw little kiddos? You're making me work my brain. I know, really digging deep in it. It, it could be four to six weeks since they've been out. They have all their little toys. But they don't go outside in the heat of the day. At least that's kind of what I notice. And they don't go outside unless an adult is there. Wonderful. I'm glad. I mean, yeah. the two little will be out by themselves. Yeah, they are. Yeah. What are they? Three and five, I think. Uh, or two and four, something like that. Three and four. Three and four. According to my my, sh my pamphlet. Yeah. So. Okay. Cute little things. Anything that I haven't asked that you think I should know, or just odd, or something you thought was weird? I wouldn't think anything is weird from over there because normally you hardly ever see anyone go in, come out. Now I saw his truck leave yesterday. Um, Maybe it was this morning I was leaving for the gym. His truck had the lights on, which is unusual for that morning, you know, 5.15 in the morning. Only fools like me are up. <laughs> so you don't usually see him leave at that time of day? Oh, was that the gray truck or what truck was that? That was his regular truck. Okay. Can you speak up just a little bit so the recorder, I know you're tired and you're stressed um, and we won't be here any longer than we have to be. You've already had a conversation with people before. You came here on your own free will to talk to us. We picked you up at, at your request and brought you here. Um, you can get up and leave at any time. You don't have to talk to us. If there's a question you don't want to answer, don't answer it. 
if you don't want to talk anymore, just tell me I want to. I'm, tell me I want to leave. And I'm kind of in the way of the door. But you're not being uh, you're, you're not being uh, interrogated as a criminal suspect. We're here to understand uh, your relationship with Chris and what you know about Chris and his family and uh, events relating to Chris Watts. Okay. So let's just start with like a timeline of your um, getting to know Chris, how you guys met, where you met, all those things. And let's just run. And I, I'm not going to ask you specific questions unless I think it's necessary. I'll let you just tell me your story. I think it's a little bit easier that way. So I just want to know how you met him, where you met him, how long you guys were dating. Regarding what number you wrote on the piece of paper, did you write the number one? Did 
Did you write the number three? No. Did you write the number four? No. Did you write the number five? No. This portion of the test is complete. Please remain still while I take the instrument out of operation. Okay, you can relax. How'd you feel? You did great. That was you remembered to lie and everything. That was awesome. That was <laughs> so yeah. you obviously are a really bad liar. That's have people told you that before, like the second mm -hmm. you tell a lie, like they can tell like on your face that because the second you lie to the number three, like I don't know if you heard me clicking, but I had to like turn down the sensitivity because you're starting to go off the page. So that is what I need to see as a polygrapher because that tells me that you know it's wrong to tell a lie um, and you're actually having a significant reaction when you lie. So that is awesome. So thank you for being a proper okay. liar. So no, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We don't want to be good liars. So. Thank you for being a horrible liar. He didn't have a wedding ring on his finger. And every time I talked to him, he didn't tell me that he was in a relationship. He didn't even mention his kids right away either. Um, and then one day he told me that he had two kids. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, so tell me about his kids. That sounded like a sarcastic comment. No, I thought it was kind of cute. I was like, oh, he's a dad. It was like right around Father's Day too. Because we don't have it on tape we discussed prior to turning the tape on. Um, on Tuesday, which would have been the 14th of August, um, you had read some newspaper articles on the 13th and the 14th that regarded this case. You had also had a conversation with Chris at some point during the day on Monday. Uh, and on Tuesday, because of what you found, specifically what you said was, and I don't let me put words in your mouth, but you, knew, you found out that his um, wife was pregnant. And I, yes. And you did not know that prior? No. And you found that out via the newspaper articles, and that caused you concern? Um, well, I just realized that he was lying to me, and I was like, well, if you can lie to me about this, what else are you lying to me about? And it made me realize that maybe his wife was in danger at that point, and it was day two, too, and she still wasn't home. Tonight, we have someone who claims to be from Chris Watts' past. Chris Watts' recent past. Now, we are not going to show you this person because he wants to continue his life without consequences for speaking out in this case, but we are going to let him tell his part of how he connects to this story. Um, this is a story that we have to be honest with you, we can't independently verify, but it is a story that could be extremely telling as we try to figure out what happened in the Watts family. This is a man who claims to be Chris Watts' former lover, and he joins me now live. Sir, can you hear me okay? I can. Some of the stuff you're talking about is pretty hard to believe. And we're getting to the point where we're wondering if you're wasting our time. Uh -huh. I mean, is there a question or, I mean, I don't know how you want me to respond to that. I don't know what else you want me to. These are the challenges that we have, right? You told us that you watched the video over and over, okay? So we know that you're aware of everything that's out there. And all you've talked about are things that anyone else knows. You haven't brought forth any information. 
you're having sex with a guy in his car and you don't know anything about him other than what the public knows about him. Okay? You took $60 from him. You, you're a self-admitted booty call. And so now we're wondering if you're a hooker who maybe blew a guy who was a murderer and maybe feels guilty about it or maybe feels like you're going to get in trouble about it. I don't know what's going on with you, but I don't know why you're here tonight. No, I'm not a hooker. So you re just, you already said, but you removed text messages? I deleted all of his stuff because he lied to me. I mean, that's what it was. It was, it was the hurt that made me delete it. And then it was the lie that made me start questioning everything else he'd been telling me for the last few days. And that's when you decided to come forward? Yes. Okay. So just for context, yes. when people delete stuff off phones, usually we go, hold no, on no, a second. No, 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 no. It and, wasn't and malicious why I wanted, at right. all. It and wasn't no, malicious at all. He, he, he lied to me. It just hurt. Like, I had never felt like he'd ever lied to me before. And it was a big lie. I mean, right. telling somebody that you're in the midst of a divorce and then you have a wife that has a 15 week old baby on the way is a huge huge thing and I was very taken back and I was just it was hurt and so at that point I just I like deleted it I had a, I had a few more quick things to say to him and then I just got rid of him that's literally what I did. I just cut him out of my life. It would honestly been like a bad breakup kind of thing. Like if none of this other stuff would have happened, that's what it would have been. That would have been the end of it. The information was not destroyed because there was anything in there that would be uh, harmful to you or potentially to Chris at this point, but harmful to you in particular. That's not what you did. No, no, you no, did no, it no. out of. Uh, excuse my language. This guy's an asshole, so I'm getting it rid of him and I'm getting this stuff off my phone. That was like me kicking him out of my life. Okay. And then, like I said, and then realizing that he lied, that was when I was like, okay, maybe his family is in danger and they're not coming back and they're not staying with a friend. Okay, can you let me know when you're ready to begin? Um, during this part of the test, I want you to focus on the back of the chair, okay? Not looking up, down, okay. or side to side, anything like that. I want you yeah, to was I doing that? Nope, you did okay. great. You, but the, obviously the clipboard is gone now, so your area of focus is going to be like in this area, okay? Okay. All right, you ready? Do it. Okay, stay still. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Regarding Shanann's disappearance, do you intend to answer all of the questions truthfully? Yes. This portion of the test is complete. Please remain still while I take the instrument out of operation. Um, d did he ever tell you that he loved you? Yes, he did. Did you ever tell him the same? A couple times. Okay. Um, now, withstanding that today, because that may those thoughts may have changed for you, but on let's go mon Sunday into Monday or Monday, did you did you still love him on those days? I think it was something where it was like I, I said it a few times and I meant it, but he definitely felt the urge to say it to me a lot more than I did to him because it was just all very new to me and I was like, take your time with this. Like you don't need to to like rush that, you know? Like I remember when he was in North Carolina and he was like trying to patch things up with his wife and he told me he loved me and I was like, don't say that to me. like. <laughs> Please go try to fit, and I mean, and that might even be in the text too, where it's like, don't, don't, like, don't say those words to me, and then go try to make peace with your wife and lay in bed with another woman. Like, just don't do that. And I was like, it's not that I don't appreciate what you're saying to me, it's like, just, it just didn't sit right for me, you know, so I just feel like... Almost like an insecurity where he had to say that to you, or...? I, I don't know, I think he, he like... Uh, looking back at all this now, I don't think he was trying to fix things with her. So saying, I love you to me, seemed like probably something that he genuinely meant. Like, I love this woman. And regardless of where he was going to end up that night. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> So 
now we need to talk about what actually happened. I feel like you're probably ready to do that. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't lie to you on that polygraph, I promise. Chris, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. stop. I, just stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. I, I want you to take a deep breath right now. We're not, we're not here to play games. We're not here to do any of that with you. We just want to know what happened. So can you start from the beginning and tell us what happened? Everything that I've, to, I've told you, I did, I did not lie on this polygraph. I am, I don't know how much I could, I could tell you right now. Like, I did not it's, 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 not even, it's not even an option right now because uh-huh. you did not pass the polygraph, uh-huh. so I know you were being deceptive. So that's not even an issue, an issue right now. The issue right now is what happened to Shan, Bella, and Celeste. This is where this is where the rubber meets the road, Chris. Like, don't let this continue any longer, please. I'm not trying to make anything continue. Like, I want them back home. Like, but you know they're not coming back home. We're confused as to why you're not taking care of your beautiful children. I'm not taking care of them right now. Right now.
Once the prosecution finishes, the defense will have an opportunity to present evidence. Then, if there are any uh, victims under the Victims' Rights Act, including Cindy and Rondi, Ronnie Watts, that have not been called by the prosecution or the defense, or any other defined victims under the Victims' Rights Act, they will have an opportunity to make a statement to the court as it relates to their rights under the Victims' Rights Act. Good morning, Mr. Ruzik. Good morning. What I'd like to say to the courts is that Shannon, Bella, and Nico love and caring people. They love life. They love being around people who love them. They also they always had good times. This is the first time they went to the beach this year and they loved it. But God only knows what happened that night. Life will never be the same without Shannon, Bella, and Celeste and Nico. Had all their lives to live. They were taken by a heartless one. This is the heartless one, the evil monster who dare you take the lives of my daughter, Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and Nico. I trusted you to take care of them, not kill them. And they also trusted you, the heartless monster, and then you take them out like trash. 
you disgust me. They were loving and caring people. You may have taken their bodies from me, but you will never take the love they had for me. They loved us more than you will ever know because you know what love, you don't know what love is because if you did, you would not have killed them. You monster, thought you would get away with this. I don't know how, the cameras do not lie. You carry them out like trash of the house. Yes, I seen the videotape. You buried my, my daughter Shannon and, and Nico in a shallow grave, and then you put Bella and Celeste in huge containers of crude oil. You heartless monster. You have, you have to live with this vision every day of your life, and I hope you see that every time you close your eyes at night. Oh, I forgot, you have no heart or feelings or love. Let me tell you something, I will think of them every day of my life, and I love them every day of my life. Prison is too good for you. This, this is hard to say, but may God have mercy on your soul. I hope you enjoy your new life. It's nothing like the one you had out here. May the courts have no mercy on you. It's hard every day. It hurts in so many ways. I have read, heard people say that you're not a monster. No, you are not. You're an evil monster. Thank you. Love you, Shannon, Bella, and Nico. Love you, Pop Up and Dad. And one other thing, and Shannon says she is super excited for justice today. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, Frankie Rusick Jr. He has asked me to read his statement for him, but he would like to stand with me if that's okay. Of course. You went from being my brother, my sister's protector, one of the most loved people in my family to someone I will spend the rest of my life trying to understand. What gave you the right to put your hands on a woman, let alone my best friend, my beloved sister, your daughters, and your son? Why weren't they enough for you? In the blink of an eye, you took away my whole world, the people that mattered to me the most. Everything in my life I loved, your children. They trusted you. They loved you. They looked up to you because you promised to keep them safe. Instead, you turned on your family. My blood is boiling as I write these last words because they are the last you will ever hear from me. I can't even think of the right words to describe the betrayal and the hate I feel. And to be honest, you aren't even worth the time and effort it takes to put my pen to this paper. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't cry for my family. They were my whole world. All I do is ask myself why. Why would you do this? You don't deserve to be called a man. What kind of person slaughters the people that love them the most? Did you really think you would get away with this? Did you really think that this was your best option, to throw away your family like they were garbage? They deserve better and you know it. I hope you spend the rest of your life staring at the ceiling every night, being haunted by what you've done. None of us deserved this. Hearing my mother and father cry themselves to sleep in this hotel room causes me anguish that is beyond words. I can't describe how this feels, how badly my heart is breaking for my poor parents. We trusted you. You have taken away my family from this earth, but you can never take them from my heart. You took away my privilege of being an uncle to the most precious little girls I've ever known. I will never hear the words Uncle Frankie again, but you will never be called Dad again either. You'll never be able to put your hands on another woman, let alone my best friend, my beloved sister, and your son. I just can't comprehend how they weren't enough for you. Shanann, Bella, and Cece loved you more than anyone. You were their hero. How could you destroy the people who loved them the most? I pray that you never have a moment's peace or a good night's rest in the cage you'll spend every day of your life in. A cage you are privileged to live in because my family isn't evil like you. We begged the district attorney to spare your life despite, because despite everything, we believe that no one has the right to take the life of another, even, so, even someone like you. I feel sorry for your family. I know the pain that they must feel knowing that they can't hug you because that's how my mother, father, and I feel every time we cry for our family. Nothing hurts more than watching or hearing my family weep for their loved ones. I just wish that I could tell the, that you would tell the truth, but I know that that is asking for more than you are capable of. I stayed up all night writing this statement. I don't sleep because of you. 
My life will never be the same because of you, but at least my conscience is clear. I get to live free, but I can't say the same for you. I haven't slept in two days because I've been anxiously waiting for this moment, the moment I get to tell you how I feel, how this has affected my family and I. My family and I can finally grieve after today. If anything, we will come out of this stronger today than we were before, and we will continue to pray for your family. Sincerely, Frankie Rusick. My name is Sandra Rusak, Shannon's mother. I wanted to say thank you for this moment. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has prayed for our beloved family, who had sent gifts, cards to us from all over the world. I know God will put the evil people where they need to be. I also want to take the time to thank the town of Frederick, um, Greeley, uh, FBI, the DA's office, the CBI, for exceptional work. We thank Nicole um, Atkinson, um, Shannon's neighbor, Nathan, and his family. Um, to me, they're our heroes. They really, they really are. God bless. Um, God makes no mistakes on who he puts in your life. Marriage is about love, trust, and friendship and unity. We marry for sickness and health to death do us part. Our daughter Shannon loved you with all of her heart. Your children loved you to the moon and back. Shannon's family was her world. Shannon put a crown on your head. But unfortunately, the day that you took their life, God removed that crown. We loved you like a son. We trusted you. Your faithful wife trusted you. Your children adored you. And they also trusted you. Your daughter, Bella Marie, sang a song proudly. And I don't know if you got to see it, but it was, Daddy, you're my hero. I have no idea who gave you the right to take their lives. But I know God and his mighty angels were there at that moment to bring them home to paradise. God gives us free will. So not only did you take the family of four, your family of four, you took your own life. I want the world to know that our daughter and her children were so loved by us. They will always be protected by God and his mighty angels. I didn't want death for you because that's not my right. Your life is between you and God now, and I pray that he has mercy for you. From Shannon's mother, Bella Marie, Celeste Catherine, and Nico Lees, Nana. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's all the witnesses that I had intended on calling, and I know that the court addressed this during the procedural um, posture. I am aware that Mr. and Mrs. Watts would also like to address the court. I would certainly invite the court, if you want, at this point to um, call upon them, or we can certainly do it after um, any uh, evidence that the defense has as well. Sure. Does Cindy or Rodney Watts wish to make a statement? <coughs> the victim's rights amendment. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Cindy Watts. Ron Watts. I have authorized you to make a statement to the court as paternal grandparents uh, of the children. Uh, and if you choose not to make a statement, but your designee, Ms. Powers, chooses to, she can do so as well. How would you like to proceed Can today? I read that? Um, yeah, do you want me to I start? I want you to start, but I would like to read Who's that. Who's going to be speaking today? Your Honor, initially, um, they've asked me, and they're hoping that they have the strength to speak. But if they do not, they've written out their statements and asked me to finish for them. So That would be, that would be fine. Who would like to go first? If I could start, Your Honor. On behalf of the Watts, Your Honor, and to the community, we thank you for the opportunity and the recognition under the Victim Bill of Rights. We come today as the grandparents and the parent of the daughter and children whose life was taken in this case. We are not here to ask for leniency. 
we are not in any way condoning or tolerating the, the crime that has occurred and the pain that has been caused. We join in our daughter-in-law and grandchildren's family in saying this should never have happened. This is not condonable. This is something that we will never get over. We appreciate the consideration that everyone has paid, most especially the families that have lost everyone. We appreciate that they begged for Christopher's life. We agree and echo what they have said, that it is not his place to take anyone's life, nor would it be our place as a community to take his life. So we thank you for the opportunity and for every consideration and effort that's been put out. The prosecution in this case has in fact respected the Victim Bill of Rights. They took the time to explain that the information that my clients had at the time that they were interviewed was not correct. They were misinformed. They were searching for answers. They were not intending to cause any pain to anyone. And they appreciate that the prosecution answered their questions and gave them the time and the respect and the consideration so that they could tell this court and everyone in this community that the interview content was not their message, that they accept that their son has done this, that they accept that he chose to plead guilty, that he sought and requested their consent and agreement for a life sentence. They appreciate that he is given the opportunity to serve that life sentence. It is his responsibility, it is his sentence, and it is not enough to make up for what has done. We understand and we join the family in that we have questions. We don't know how such a thing could possibly happen or that a man that was responsible for raising his children and protecting his wife would take the steps that he did and that he would disregard their bodies and the love that he had for them and they had for him and everyone else and take the gestures and put this community through the investigation and the discovery and the responsibility of bringing justice. We do not understand that. We do not think it was appropriate. We cannot begin to think that an explanation will ever justify it. My clients indicate that they understand that a full opportunity for a confession with all of the responsibility and accountability has not occurred. And they support the family and the request that that happen, if not today, at an appropriate time, in an appropriate manner, so that everyone can have peace to understand to the best of their ability the details that they need and to have their questions answered. And by giving this opportunity of a life sentence, we hope that he embraces that moment, that had the death penalty been pursued, there would not have been an opportunity to be accountable and to give a full confession. And had the death penalty been sought, counsel would have fought for his life, the prosecutors would have been engaged in a multiple year battle, the families would have been torn apart, this community would have had to subsidize it and endure it, and we have so much respect and gratefulness that that did not happen. We would strongly encourage Christopher Watts to give that full confession in the tone and in the timing that he thinks is appropriate with the guidance of his counsel. We feel that it would be appropriate and helpful to ease the pain and the suffering, but we also say we don't think that there's anything that he can say that will ever account for his behavior. There's nothing that can be done to cure the harm he has caused, and he has the responsibility to serve his sentence with dignity and with regard for everyone and to spend every breath that he has left in an atonement for what he has done. Do you want to read it? Yes. Cindy Watts. My name is Cindy Watts. I am the grandmother of two beautiful granddaughters, Bella Marie, Celeste Catherine Watts. I am also the mother of Christopher Watts, who I will be directing most of my statement to. First, I'd like to begin by recognizing the absolute horror of this crime 
and acknowledging the devastating loss that both the Rusek family as well as our family have faced. Our families have been irreparably broken by the needless deaths of Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Nico. This is something we will never get over. We will always mourn the loss of our family, and in that, we are united in our grief. I am still struggling to understand how and why this tragedy occurred. I may never be able to understand and accept it, but I pray for peace and healing for all of us. Now to my son, Christopher. I have known you since the day you were born into this world. I have watched you grow from a quiet and sweet, curious child who Bella reminded me so much of to a young man who worked hard in sports and later mechanics to achieve your goals. You are a good friend, brother, father, and son. You have, we have loved you from the beginning and we still love you now. This might be hard for some to understand how I can sit here under these circumstances and tell you, although we are heartbroken, although we can't imagine what could have led us to this day, but we love you. Maybe you can't believe it either. As the Lord said in Jeremiah 3.31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And you, as your mother, Chris, I have always loved you, and I still do. I hate what has happened. Your father and sister and I are struggling to understand why. But we will remain faithful as your family, just as God remains faithful because of his unconditional love for all, for us all. We love you. And we forgive you, son. <laughs> Judge, if I could read Mr. Watts' statement. Yes. My name is Ronnie Watts, and I am the grandfather of Bella, Celeste, Nico Watts, and I am the father of Shannon. I am the father of Christopher Watts as well. And one of the most important things I've done in my life is to raise my children and to watch as they started their own families. I spent many years coaching Little League and talking to my son, taking him to the races, and sharing my love and knowledge of cars with him. He was just as involved with his girls. I believe he loves his girls. I know he does. This tragedy has impacted my family in so many ways. Beyond losing my precious grandchildren, our beloved daughter-in-law, we are forced to question everything. We still don't have all the answers, and I hope one day, Christopher, you can help us. Chris, I want to talk to you as a father and son. You are here today accepting responsibility but I want to tell you this now. I love you. Nothing will ever change that. And I want you to find peace. And today is your first step. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. Chris, I forgive you and your sister forgives you. And we will never abandon you. And we love you. Dad. Judge, thank you for the opportunity to address the court. Your Honor, there are no words to adequately describe the unimaginable tragedy that brings us before this court today. By my comments, I'm not even going to try to express the horror, the pain, or the suffering that the defendant has caused to these families, to this community, and to all who are a part of this investigation. However, I do want to spend a few minutes sharing with the court the details of the crime, as so far you've only had an opportunity to review the affidavit and a few facts here and there that have been offered to the court in the motions and pleadings that have been filed. 
The questions that have screamed out to anyone who will listen since August 13th of 2018 are why and how. Why did this have to happen? How could a seemingly normal husband and father annihilate his entire family? For what? These are the questions that only one individual in this courtroom or on this planet knows the answers to. I fully expect we will not receive the answers to these questions today, nor will we, will we at any point in the future. I don't expect that he will ever tell the truth about what truly happened or why. Even if he did, there is no rational way that any human being could find those answers acceptable responses to such horrific questions. The best we can do is try to piece together some kind of understanding from the evidence that is available to us. And the evidence tells us this. The defendant coldly and deliberately ended four lives, not in a fit of rage, not by way of accident, but in a calculated and sickening manner. Shanann was 34 years old. She had married the defendant in November of 2012. Over the weekend leading up to August 13th, she had been at a work conference in Phoenix, Arizona and re uh, returned home in the early morning hours of August 13th. We know that she got home about 1.45 in the morning. The doorbell camera on their home shows her arriving back home uh, from the airport. Shortly thereafter, at least according to the defendant, they had a, what he referred to as an emotional conversation about the state of their marriage and about what their lives would look like going forward. What was said during that emotional conversation, only he knows. What we do know is that shortly after that, the defendant strangled her to death with his own hands. We know that he slowly took her life the morning of August 13th. We know that this was not done in an uncontrolled, vengeful manner that he tried to describe to agents from CBI and the FBI. If that were the case, you would expect to see vicious, horrible bruising about her neck, shoulders, and face. You would expect to see the hyoid bone in her neck broken. You would expect to see some kind of defensive wounds on his body as she struggled and fought for her own life. None of those are present. The only injuries that were on Shanann's body were one set of finger uh, or bruising, what appeared to be fingernail or finger mark bruising to the right side of her neck. We know that our experts will tell us that it takes two to four minutes to strangle someone to death manually with their own hands. The horror that she felt as the man that she loved wrapped his hands around her throat and choked the life out of her must have been unimaginable. Even worse, what must Bella, age four, and Celeste, age three, must have experienced or thought as their father, the one man on this planet, who was supposed to nurture and protect them, was snuffing out their lives. They both died from smothering. Let me say that again. The man seated to my right smothered his daughters. Why? Imagine the horror in Bella's mind as her father took her last, last breaths away. Your Honor, understand very clearly, Bella fought back for her life. The frenulum, the connective tissue between her upper lip and her gum, had an inch and a half, excuse me, a centimeter and a half laceration. She bit her tongue multiple times before she died. She fought back for her life as her father smothered her. Celeste had no such injuries. In fact, she had no external injuries at all. But according to the medical examiner, she was smothered nonetheless. The defendant then methodically and calmly loaded their bodies into his work truck, not in a hasty, hasty or disorganized way. He was seen from the neighbor's doorbell camera, backing his truck into the driveway, going back and forth into the house and back out to the truck three different times, one time for each of their bodies. He then drove them away from their family home one final time, intent on hiding any evidence of the crimes that he had just committed. 
in one final sign of callousness for his wife, his daughters, and their unborn son, and their remains, he drove them to a location that he thought no one would ever find them, to one of the oil tank batteries with which he was so familiar. He knew this was safe. He had texted a co-worker the night before saying, I'll head out to that site. I'll take care of it. He had carefully ensured that he would be alone in the middle of the plains to secrete away the remains of his family in a place that he hoped they would never be found. In one final measure of disrespect for the family he once had, he ensured that they would not be together even in death, or he, so he thought. He disposed of them in different locations. He buried Shanann and Nico in a shallow grave away from the oil tanks. Bella and Celeste were thrown away in the oil tanks at this facility. Different tanks so these little girls wouldn't be together in death. Imagine this, Your Honor. This defendant took those little girls and put them through a hatch at the top of an oil tank eight inches in diameter. Bella had scratches on her left buttocks from being shoved through this hole. A tuft of blonde hair was found on the edge of one of these hatches. The defendant told investigators that Bella's tank seemed emptier than CC's because of the sound that the splashes made. These were his daughters. Significantly, when his co-workers arrived at the tank battery later that morning, to a person, they all described him as acting completely normally. It was a normal work day. Even while his daughter sank in the oil and water not far away from him. And then his efforts at deception truly began. We've all seen the emotionless interviews that the defendant gives to the local media asking for help in locating his family. We watched as he claimed that the house was empty without them and that he hoped that they were somewhere safe and that he just wanted them to come home. He told investigators that they were at home sleeping when he left for work that morning and that Shanann had told him that he was, she was taking the girls to a friend's house for the day. What is striking about this case, Your Honor, beyond the horrors that I've already described to you, is the number of collateral victims that he created by his actions. While he stood in front of TV cameras asking for the safe return of his family, scores of law enforcement officers, neighbors, friends and family scoured the area, fretted for their safe return. They texted him begging for any information and sending him their best wishes, all the while he hid what he had done. The list of indirect victims does not end there. Think of the firefighters and the Colorado State Patrol hazmat experts who had to don protective suits and who were called upon to pull Bella and Celeste out of those oil tanks. Or the coroner employees who had to conduct these autopsies. Or the victim assistants who frant frantically attempted to ease the suffering of those affected. All of this, Your Honor, for what? Why? Why did this have to happen? His motive was simple, Your Honor. He had a desire for a fresh start, to begin a relationship with a new love that overpowered all decency and feelings for his wife, his daughters, and unborn son. While Shanann texted the defendant over and over again in the days and weeks leading up to her death, attempting to save her marriage, the defendant secreted pictures of his girlfriend into his phone and searched and texted, excuse me, texted her at all hours of the night. While Shanann sent the defendant self-help self and relationship counseling books, one of which, ironically enough, was thrown in the garbage, he was searching the internet for secluded vacation spots to take his new love in researching jewelry. And while Shanann took the girls to visit family in North Carolina, the defendant went to car museums and the sand dunes with his new girlfriend. The stark contrast between the subjects of their internet and text content is absolutely stunning. Even the morning after he killed them and disposed of their bodies, he made several phone calls. One was to the school where the girls were supposed to start, telling the school that he would, that the girls would not be coming to school anymore, that they were being unenrolled, presumably to give him some more time before law, enf law enforcement notification about them going missing. He contacted a realtor 
to start discussing the selling of his house, and he texted with his girlfriend about their future. None of this answers the questions of why, however. If he was this happy and wanted a new start, get a divorce. You don't annihilate your family and throw them away like garbage. Why did Nico, Celeste, Bella, and Shanann have to lose their lives in order for him to get what he wanted? Your Honor, justice demands the maximum sentence under the agreement reached by the parties. As you will recall, the agreement calls for life sentences as to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste, and all of those to run consecutively to one another. It also calls for the count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy as to Nico to run consecutively to counts one, two, and three. I would suggest that the extreme aggravation present in the defendant's conduct and in his, uh, the efforts that I have described mandate that the sentences for counts seven, eight, and nine, the tampering with a deceased human body, each be the maximum of 12 years and that those sentences run consecutively to one another. It is very clear that each of these acts, excuse me, that these were not the subject of one act, but each oil tank that he walked up with his daughter's bodies and the hole that he dug for his wife and unborn son mandate a mandatory consecutive sentence. It's been alluded to this morning, but the defendant was certainly eligible for the death penalty in this case under the existing law in the state of Colorado. As you heard, Shanann's family strongly opposed my office seeking the death penalty and being bound to the criminal justice system for the next several decades. That's in large part, as you've heard, why we have reached the agreement that we have. Four lives were lost at the hands of the defendant on August 13th for reasons that we will never fully understand, nor will we know. In the end, the Rusick family was much more merciful towards him than he was towards his wife, his daughters, and his unborn son. Prison for the remainder of his life is exactly where he belongs for murdering his entire family. Thank you. Are you seeking any one day to file a request for restitution? I am, Your Honor, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Watts has asked us to share this morning that he is devastated by all of this. And although he understands that words are hollow at this point, he is sincerely sorry for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Showing mercy on Mr. Watts is understood. Uh, and I respect that decision to request that the district attorney not seek the death penalty in this case. And so the court is going to accept this plea bargain under the circumstances. Words that come to mind when I hear the evidence in this case are a senseless crime and the viciousness of the crime. And equally aggravating in this court's determination is the despicable act of disposing of the bodies in the manner in which they were done in this case. I've been a judicial officer now for starting my 17th year and I uh, could objectively say that this is perhaps the most uh, inhumane and vicious crime that I have handled out of the thousands of cases that I have seen. And nothing less than a maximum sentence um, would be appropriate. And anything less than the maximum sentence would depreciate the seriousness of this offense. So the court is going to sentence Mr. Watts as follows. With regard to count number one, murder in the first degree as it relates to Shanann Watts, the court is going to sentence you, sir, to uh, a life sentence in the Colorado Department of Corrections, followed um, excuse me, with no possibility of parole. And that is going to run consecutively to all but counts three and four 
with regard to count two as it relates to murder in the first degree with Bella the court is going to sentence you to life in the Colorado Department of Corrections with no possibility of parole with regard to count number three the court is going to sentence you as it relates to Celeste to life in Colorado Department of Corrections with no possibility of parole with regard to counts four and five relating to Bella and Celeste as a different theory of first-degree murder the court is going to sentence you to life in the Colorado Department of Corrections and legally those sentences must run concurrently as a different theory of first-degree murder recognizing um, the unlawful termination of pregnancy for the unborn child that has been named Nico the court absolutely believes that the maximum sentence of 48 years would be appropriate to run consecutive to the other charges with an additional mandatory parole period of three years as set forth by statute with regard to count number seven as it relates to tampering with a deceased body as well as counts eight and nine each a class three felony the court is going to impose a maximum sentence of 12 years each for those counts to run consecutively to the other counts the court is going to order that the statutory fees be paid the and court costs the court's going to grant the prosecution 91 days to file a notice of restitution and that will be the sentence of the court we will shortly be in recess I would respectfully ask the parties that uh, you remain in your seat there is a plan by the deputies on allowing people to exit the courtroom so please remain seated until you are authorized to leave the courtroom based on the direction of the deputies deputies I would respectfully ask that you take this defendant into custody and have him serve the rest of his life in the Department of Corrections we are in recess Right. Chris. Come here. Chris. Come here. Chris.